My name is Rick Renner, and today I'm in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem in a very important place. Behind me is a half column that is behind glass and is beautifully lighted. What is the significance of this column? It is alleged that this is the column that was used by Pontius Pilate for the flogging of Jesus. When they would scourge an individual, they would take him and they would tie him over a column just like this, usually affixing his hands in such a way that he was not able to use them to defend himself or to move. He was fixed in one place over a column. Then the torturers would come, usually two of them, each of them with a scourge, long whips, and on the end of every piece of leather were attached pieces of metal, bone, glass, very razor sharp objects. Then they would begin beating the victim mercilessly. You can see how severe was a flogging by simply looking at this column, a column made of stone, but it bears the lacerating marks of the scourge. If that's what happened to the column made of stone, let me ask you, what do you think happened to Jesus back that day when they beat him? This is why Isaiah 53 verse 5 says, we're healed by the stripes of Jesus. When Peter wrote about this, in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24, he says we're healed, the Greek says, by the full body bruise of Jesus. It wasn't just a few little stripes. Jesus' body was literally ripped to shreds when he was laid across this column and he was beaten for you and for me. And according to Isaiah 53, 5, it was so you and I could be healed. And that is what I'm going to talk to you about today. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insight and understanding from the Word of God. Here's Rick. I am so glad you've joined me for today's program because today we're going to cover the stripes that Jesus received on his body for your healing. And as I told you in the introduction to today's program, when Jesus was laid across that column and was beaten, his body was literally torn to shreds so that you and I could eventually receive divine healing. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Don't miss a word of this. Stay with me all the way to the end. But I want to remind you that I'm offering you my series called Unknown Facts about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's called Unknown Facts because they're facts that were not known to me. I grew up in church hearing the same sermon every year, and I was grateful for that, but I always thought, surely there's more to the story. So when I became an adult and learned how to study, I began to dig through the Gospels, and wow, what I found just caused this story to come alive for me. And I've put all of that information into this 25-part series, which comes with an amazing study guide with all the Greek words, and the definitions, the points, the principles, so many things about Roman law and culture from that time. It is just packed. This would be great for your personal growth and would really be great for a Bible study. We're also offering you my book called Paid in Full. Now today I'm going to be reading to you from Paid in Full because I can't really improve on what I wrote. It is so explicit about the beating that Jesus received. But the full name of the book is Paid in Full, an in-depth look at the defining moments of Christ's passion. I really love this book because it took me somewhere spiritually I had never been when I wrote it. It really helped me to understand the price that Jesus paid more than I had ever understood it. And I believe this book will take you somewhere new spiritually as well. But before we get to the beating that Jesus received, let's go back to Pilate's palace in Matthew chapter 27. Jesus has just been returned to Pilate's palace. He's been over at Herod's place, over on the other side of Jerusalem. And when Herod was finished, he sent Jesus back to Pilate. And now Pilate has the problem of Jesus again. And he announces, I'm going to let this man go free. You want his blood, so let me scourge him. That'll be a bloody mess, but then I'm going to let him go free. And the people were furious that Pilate was going to let Jesus go free. And they caused a tumult or an uproar. And that's what we read about in Matthew 
chapter 27, verse 24. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but rather that a tumult was made. That word tumult is the Greek word which describes an uproar, a tumult, trouble that throws things into disorder, emotions that are raging out of control, a public outcry that is accompanied by shrieks and hysterical wailing, a disturbance that results in panic and a breach of public order, a public disturbance. Well, Romans really didn't like public disturbances. And this one really took Pilate off guard. We know that because the Bible says a tumult was made. Was made is a translation of the Greek word genomai, which describes something that comes to pass unexpectedly, an event that is unanticipated and therefore surprising. This completely took Pilate off guard. Before he knew it, things were spinning out of control. And how did he respond? The Bible tells us. He took water and he washed his hands before the multitude saying, I'm innocent of the blood of this just person. See you to it. And notice the Bible says he did it before the multitude. That word before means to do something publicly. He wanted to make sure the entire multitude saw he was washing his hands. Now, what does that mean that he took water and washed his hands? Well, let me read to you directly from my notes. Water is symbolic of cleansing and hands are symbolic of our lives. The washing of hands was a ritual often used symbolically for the removal of one's guilt. When Pilate washed his hands in that water, he was declaring, I am clear of all guilt regarding the blood of this just person. And in fact, he even said, I am innocent. The word innocent is a Greek word, which literally means I am guiltless. I am not punishable for what is about to take place. And then he surrendered to the demands of the religious leaders to have Jesus crucified. But first, the Bible tells us in Matthew 26, verse 26, that Pilate scourged Jesus. He scourged Jesus. Now I'm going to read to you directly from paid in full, again, because I can't improve on what I wrote. And I want to take my time because this is very important. What does it mean to scourge an individual? The word scourged is from the Greek word fragello. It was one of the most horrific words used in the ancient world because of the terrible images that immediately came to mind when a person heard that word. When a decision was made to scourge an individual, now stay with me, I know I'm reading, but I want you to really hear what I'm going to say. When a decision was made to scourge an individual, first, the victim's body was completely stripped naked so that his entire flesh would be open to the beating action of the whip. So the first thing this tells us is when Jesus was laid across that column, he was laid across that column completely naked. Every article of clothing had been removed. Then the victim was bound to a two foot high scourging post. That's what I showed you at the very first of today's program. His hands were tied over his head to a metal ring and his wrists were secured to that ring to restrain his body from movement. And when in that locked person, the victim couldn't wiggle or move, trying to dodge the lashes that would be laid across his back and across his body. So when a person was scourged, they were fixed in a position when they couldn't defend themselves, they couldn't wiggle, they couldn't move. They just had to stay there and take the beating action of the whip. Romans were professionals at scourging. They took special delight in the fact that they were the best at scourging people. Once the victim was harnessed to the post and stretched over it, the Roman soldiers began to put them through torture. One writer notes that the mere anticipation of the whip caused the victim's body to grow rigid. It caused the muscles to knot in his stomach. It caused the color to drain from his cheeks and his lips to draw tight against his teeth as he waited for the first sadistic blow of the whip that would begin to tear his body apart. This was horrific. The scourge was made of a short wooden handle with several long pieces of leather protruding from it. And at the end of these pieces of leather were sharp pieces of metal glass, wire, and jagged fragments of bones. It was considered to be one of the most feared and deadly weapons of the entire Roman world. It was so ghastly that the mere threat of a scourge could calm a crowd or bend the will of even the strongest rebel. Even the most hardened criminals recoiled from the idea of being submitted to the beating of a Roman scourge. 
Most often, two torturers were used to carry out the punishment. Simultaneously, they lashed the victim from both sides. And as the dual whips struck the victim, the leather straps with their sharp, jagged objects descended and extended over his entire body. Each piece of metal, wire, bone, or glass cut deeply through the victim's skin and into the flesh, shredding muscles and sinews. You see, this isn't just little stripes. This is literally the shredding of the human body. It's amazing. Every time the whip pounded across the victim, those straps of leather curled around his torso, painfully biting into the flesh of his abdomen and upper chest. Each stroke lacerated the sufferer. He tried to thrash about, but was unable to move because his wrists were so tied to the metal ring above his head, helpless to escape the whip. Normally, the victim would scream for mercy that the anguish might come to an end. Every time the torturer struck a victim, the straps of leather attached to the wooden handle would cause multiple lashes as the sharp objects at the end of each string strap sank deep into the flesh and raked across the victim's body. Then the torture would jerk hard and jerk back, pulling hard enough to tear out whole pieces of human flesh from the body. The victim's back, buttocks, back of the legs, stomach, upper chest, and face would soon be disfigured by the blows of the whip. Historical records record that a victim's back could become so mutilated after a Roman scourge that his spine would actually be exposed. Others recorded how the bowels of a victim would spill out through the open wounds created by the scourge. The early church historian Eusebius wrote, the veins were laid bare, the very muscles, sinews, and bowels of the victim were open to exposure. You see, this was much more than simple stripes laid across Jesus' back. This was a horrific event that Pilate put Jesus through. This is the way that Romans scourged individuals. And when the Bible says Pilate had him scourged, my goodness, we just read over that and don't understand it. It was horrific what Jesus went through when he was scourged. With so many blood vessels sliced open by the whip, the victim would begin to experience a profuse loss of blood and bodily fluids. The heart would bump harder and harder, struggling to get blood to the parts of the body that were bleeding profusely. But it was like pumping water through an open water hydrant. There was nothing to stop the blood from pouring through the victim's open wounds. This loss of blood caused the victim's blood pressure to drop drastically. And because of the massive loss of bodily fluids, he would experience excruciating thirst, often fainting from the pain or going into shock and frequently, the victim's heartbeat would become so irregular that he would go into cardiac arrest. This is a taste of Roman scourging. Now listen to this. According to Judas law, Jewish law, the Jews were permitted to give 40 lashes to a victim. But because the 40th lash usually proved fatal, the Jews would only give 39. But the Romans had no limit to the number of lashes they gave a victim. And the scourging Jesus experience was at the hands of Romans, not Jews. It is entirely possible, even probable, that Jesus received more than 40 lashes across his body. In fact, if you consider the explosive rage the Jews felt for Jesus that day, it is likely he received many more than 40 lashes. So when the Bible tells us Jesus was scourged, we know exactly what kind of beating Jesus received that night. What toll did the whip exact on Jesus' body? The New Testament doesn't tell us exactly, but Isaiah 52 verse 14 says, As many as saw him were amazed. His visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. If we take this scripture literally for what it says, we conclude that Jesus' physically, physical body was marred nearly beyond recognition. That is a Roman scourge. Now, it's kind of hard to hear all of that, but the truth is what I read to you really is lightly talking about the experience. I could tell you much more in graphic detail, but you would not enjoy hearing it. But what I want you to understand 
is Jesus didn't just receive a few lashes across his body. His body was literally torn open. And if you can imagine, this preceded crucifixion. This was just the overture to what he was about to experience. This had been such a grueling night for Jesus. Jesus had been betrayed. He had been arrested, treated terrible, led like an animal from the Garden of Gethsemane over to the palace of Caiaphas, where he was abused by the soldiers that held him and then terribly abused by all the religious leaders who spat on him, struck him, slapped him, and played games with Jesus. Then he was taken to Pilate, who didn't know what to do with him. So Pilate sent him across town to Herod's palace, and Herod mocked him, screamed uncontrollably in the face of Jesus with his men of war and the religious leaders. They mocked him and made fun of him and played charades with Jesus, said, we're done with this man, then sent him back across town to Pilate. Pilate tries to set him free. Pilate can't set him free because a tumult is made, and then Jesus is severely scourged. Jesus' body is literally torn open. His muscles, his sinews, his flesh, all of it is shredded by the scourge that has been laid across his body by two torturers who simultaneously strike him from both sides. All of that occurred on that post that I showed you at the beginning to today's program. And when you look at that post, when you're in Jerusalem and you visit that site, it's amazing because it's a post made of granite which is a very, very strong stone that you can see the effect of the scourge in the stone 2,000 years later. If the scourge left those marks on granite, what in the world did the scourge do to the human body, to Jesus' body? Wow. But wait, that's not the end of the story. The Bible goes on. And the Bible tells us in Matthew 27, verse 26, and when he had scourged Jesus, he then delivered him to be crucified. Now, crucifixion is what we're going to see in the next program. But look what happens next in verse 27. Matthew 27, verse 27, the Bible says, Then the soldiers of the governor, that's of Pilate, took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. The whole band is again the Greek word speeder, which was the word for a Roman cohort. So this is not just a few soldiers, a cohort was a tenth of a legion, well-trained Roman soldiers who were equipped with the finest weaponry of the day. A tenth of a legion would be about 600. Well, we know that's how many soldiers were stationed in Pilate's palace. So now the whole band of soldiers, all of them come together to mock Jesus. And in Matthew 27, verse 28, the Bible says, they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. Now, Jesus has already endured a scourging. His body has been laid bare. His muscles have been exposed. His veins are exposed. Jesus' blood is flowing out of his body like an open hydrant. He is already bleeding profusely. And even though Jesus has been put through this suffering, now they begin to mentally and verbally abuse him again. They set him in the midst of nearly 600 soldiers who strip him completely naked and then put on him a scarlet robe. That word scarlet it's a very specific word. It describes the most expensive garment in the ancient world, a garment that was dyed in purple. Purple was very rare, and it was only used for officials that were very high ranking. It was used for politicians, for generals, for emperors. And the word robe is the Greek word, which specifically describes a cloak worn by soldiers or military officers, magistrates, kings, or emperors. When they wrapped that garment around Jesus, they were again mocking him. Now, where in the world would they have gotten a garment like that? Well, they were in Pilate's palace. So, of course, that kind of garment would have been very available. They took one of Pilate's garments and they wrapped it around Jesus. Then the Bible tells us in Matthew 27, verse 29, And when they had planted a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. When the Bible says they planted a crown of thorns, that word thorns describes a plant of thorns so sharp that it alone could cause delirium or possibly even death. That's how sharp the thorns were. 
But the Bible says they put it upon his head. Put upon is the Greek word epithemi, which in this case means to forcibly thrust or to shove. So just imagine these thorns already have the ability to cause delirium or even death. Now they put it on Jesus' head, not lightly, but the Greek word means they thrust it upon his head or they jammed it on his head. They shoved it into his head. Those thorns were so long they would have, struck, they would have dragged across Jesus' skull as they shoved it on his head. So now his body's been ripped open by the scourging whip. Now his head is profusely bleeding because of the thorns which are scraping across his skull. And then the Bible says they put a reed in his right hand and bowed the knee before him and mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Well, there was a famous statue of Caesar holding a reed in his hand showing that he was the great emperor. They were mocking Jesus when they put that reed in his hand. They were mocking him saying, what kind of emperor are you? What kind of king are you? And when the Bible says they bowed the knee, the Greek actually says, and bowing the knee before him, they mocked him. They were mocking him as they bowed the knee. All these soldiers, 600 of them, one by one, coming in front of him, dropping to their knees, mocking Jesus saying, what kind of a king are you? Hail, thou king of the Jews. And in Matthew 27, verse 30, the Bible says they spit upon him and then they took the reed and smote him on the head. The word spit, the Greek word, which means they got right into his face and spit hard into his face. Then they took the reed out of his hand and smote him on the head. The word smote that is used here is the Greek word, which means to beat, to strike, or even better, to violently smack. So now they're smacking Jesus with a reed that they had put in his hand. And then Matthew 27, verse 31 says, And after they had mocked him, they took the robe off of him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. Interesting, the word led in verse 31 is again the Greek word apago, which was the very word used to describe a shepherd who tied a rope around the neck of his sheep and then led it down the path to where it was supposed to go. Amazing. Now, when Peter recalled all of this, he wrote about it in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. And listen to what Peter said. By his stripes, you are healed. That word stripes, the Greek word molops, describes a full body bruise, a terrible lashing that draws blood and produces discoloration and swelling of the entire body. Peter wasn't speaking by revelation. He was speaking by memory. He was there when it took place. He says Jesus' entire body was beaten. His entire body was discolored. Jesus was a swollen mess, and Jesus went through all of that for our healing. And for those who think that this word healing describes spiritual healing, I want to disappoint you. This is the Greek word, eomai, which always describes the physical healing of the body. Jesus endured all of this to pay the price for my healing and for your healing. Jesus endured all of that so you could be well. And that's why Isaiah 53, 5 says, by his stripes, by his full body bruise, this grueling thing Jesus went through, because of that, you are healed. We're out of time, but I'll be back in just a moment, and I'm going to pray for your healing. From the courtyard of Pilate to the hill of Calvary, every step Jesus took on that Good Friday, he had you in mind. The Bible says Jesus died so our debt could be paid in full. In his book, Paid in Full, Rick Renner guides you through the details of Jesus' final hours on earth. In Paid in Full, you'll discover that this striking narrative of love and redemption is much more than the story taught in Sunday school. This powerful book can be yours for just $15. When you call or go online today, you can also get unknown facts about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Available in digital or physical formats, starting at just $40, you can discover the power of the cross and the plan to forgive mankind of sin like never before. Don't miss this special offer, paid in full, and unknown facts about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Call now 
or go to renner.org. My name is Joe Renner coming to you from Moscow, Russia. And I want to tell you how your support is impacting thousands of people right here in Moscow. All around the world, people are living longer, and many elderly people in Moscow are left helpless and lonely. Loneliness is a terrible thing. No one should be left to die in loneliness. But because of your financial support, we're able to reach these wonderful people. Each week, we hold a concert for this great generation. After the concert, we invite these people to stay for a Bible study where they hear about Christ. Through these events, thousands of people have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior in the sunset years of their lives. Would you consider joining us as a partner today? With your support, we're able to reach even more of these precious people. No one should die lonely. More importantly, no one should die without the opportunity to know Jesus. Right from your home, you can help us help others by becoming a partner and a part of the solution. Please call us or go online to winner.org. Your generous support makes a difference. Please call or go online right now. I want to read to you Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5. It says, He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him. And now listen to this. And with His stripes we are healed. Peter referred to this. And Peter said it like this in 1 Peter 2, 24. By whose stripes ye were healed. That word stripes, the Greek word nomolops, describes a full body bruise, a terrible lashing that draws blood and produces discoloration and swelling of the entire body. The word healed is the Greek word eomai, a word that refers to physical healing, not spiritual healing, physical healing. It's barred from the medical world to describe the physical healing or curing of the human body. Isaiah 53, verse 5, 1 Peter 2, verse 24 tells us Jesus' body was bruised. Jesus' body was ripped to shreds. Peter, speaking by memory, says, oh my. His body was completely swollen, was completely discolored. It was a full body bruise. Jesus' body nearly was not recognizable when they were finished with him. And all of this was for our physical healing. And today, you can be physically healed. Now get ready, because I'm going to pray for you. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for the price that was paid for us to be made well. And in Jesus' name, I rebuke every form of sickness that is attacking my friend, mental, physical, chemical, regardless of what kind it is, I rebuke it in Jesus' name. I command you to go. Jesus paid the price for healing, and I speak the healing power of God to you in the name of Jesus. Wow. It's been so good to be with you today and to share this word. Remember Ecclesiastes 8.4. It says, where the word of a king is, there's power. God's word really has power. Let God's word release that power in your life today. And I'll see you in the next program where I'm going to be talking to you about the act of crucifixion. Thank you for joining Rick Renner today. For more information about Rick Renner Ministries and product resources, visit renner.org and connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.